Hi guys, welcome back to Infinite Possibilities, the podcast where we explore the lives of amazing people, their choices, challenges, and opportunities. And today I have a very special guest, Michael. Hi. <laughs> so what's amazing in choices here? What are we doing here? Okay, so this is the podcast where we, <laughs> whoa, no one's ever asked me that. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Okay, we're going to talk about, um, so the reason why I called this podcast Infinite Possibilities, it's about that like, you know, um, people, they have a lot of different crossroads in their life and then it's their different choices and uh-huh. their challenges okay. and then the opportunities. That so this is kind of like, you know, life is what happens to you while you're making other plans. You might have all of these strategies in mind. I'm going to do this, that and the other thing. And then you end up doing something else that's really amazing, but none of those things that you said you would do. Yeah, 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 essentially. But yeah, how you change like one tiny bit in your life and then everything changes. Ah. So that's where the infinite possibilities comes in. Excellent. And Michael, you have an amazing life, but shall we start from the beginning? (laughs) So let's go into high school. So Michael, what kind of kid were you like growing up? Very nerdy, hey? Hey, really? Yes. Really? Who would have thought? Um, <laughs> Can't tell. Can't tell. <laughs> it, it's an extension. So um, what kind of kid? Uh, look, probably shy, introverted. I didn't do public speaking. I remember that very much. Um, mother had a lot of dogs. If you look on the filing cabinet behind you, see the little magnet? Grab that magnet. Ooh. Grab it. Yeah. Grab it. Oh, wait. Oh, oh. wait. Magnet. This one? That's it. Oh, well, so, <laughs> grab it and magnet. It says smooth fox terrier property laws, right? Which effectively are, if I like it, it's mine. <laughs> if it's in my mouth, it's mine. If I had a little while ago, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. So a smooth fox terrier is a dog. Uh, and so I grew up with every photograph of me as a kid being from the knees down because my mother showed fox terriers. And they're about this high, so about oh. knee height. So I would hold the dog and she would take the photo and the photo would be of the dog, not of me, the kid. Oh. <laughs> so I still have um, fox terriers because I get my mother's retirement dogs, the ones that can't show anymore. So she's still around. She still shows. She's in her late 60s, I suppose. Math. Yes, she is. Yeah. <laughs> Very late 60s. And so she shows fox terriers. So I grew up going to dog shows on the weekend, heading out to places like, you know, Esk and Oki and uh, Pittsworth and Gumbungi. Remember those ones? So you go on the weekend, you'd sit in the back of the car trying to do your homework, um, <laughs> particularly about grade eight, grade nine. And you'd drive out to the middle of nowhere, which effectively is where Gumbungi and Pittsworth are. And um, actually, it's not nowhere, but you can see nowhere from there. And so then, um, yeah, lots of dog shows and lots of setting up of tarps. And the worst thing, you're probably not a doggy person. You're probably not a dog show person. What makes you think that? You're really not giving off a dog show vibe. So the (laughs) thing with dog shows is you drive for two hours to get to the middle of nowhere. You set up camp about eight o'clock. At 20 past nine, you go in and you get knocked out. So you can't go any further in the competition. And then you turn around, pack everything up and go home again. Or I don't know what's worse. Like you drive two hours for a three minute experience to get knocked out and that's the end of your day. Or you rock up, you win and you could be there until four o'clock in the afternoon. So like, what were you going to do with that day? Choose your suffering. <laughs> Choose your suffering. <laughs> So that was kind of me, I guess. I did all the high school courses. I did, uh, I did the academic track. So I had to choose between infinite possibilities, you know. <laughs> there was the academic track. Yeah. There was the good with your hands manual labor track. And there was the, which was clearly never going to be me. And then there was the commercial track, the business. And some, for some reason, the academics and the business were, you couldn't do both. So you couldn't do the commercial stream and do like physics or chemistry. You could, you could do the commercial stream, but you had to do the accounting, the secretarial studies, which I did, which meant I had to learn how to type, hence the typewriters. Um, And I also did shorthand. So I learned how to do shorthand. You don't even know what that is, do you? Um, Is that like abbreviations and stuff? 
No. So wrong and yet kind of right. <laughs> so it is a phonetic script. It looks a bit like Arabic writing. Uh, so you've got like shay hooks and j hooks. So it's all phonetic. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's basically fast handwriting. Yeah. So you could sit there and be a stenographer and write. And I still try to occasionally do it very badly. Damn. So this is like for interpreters, right? Where they just... I'm not interpreters. It's, it's more like court reporters. So someone's talking and in the 70s and 80s, you didn't have recording and you certainly didn't have automatic transcription software. So what you ended up doing was you'd write things down really quickly. So I did the commercial track. I ended up doing secretarial studies. I did accounting. Because I couldn't do the physics, the chemistry and the bio death sciences, I ended up doing the... Um, What's called what was called multi-strand science. It was effectively all the sciences in one, which was kind of cool. I got the subject prize for multi-strand, for English, and for secretarial studies. Wow, as a I smart recall. kid right there. Just to make um, parents proud. <laughs> don't know about that. I don't think they quite know what I do even now. Um, and then, um, uh, oh, I did film and TV as my um, muck around subject because you only needed five courses to get yeah. your TE score and I had six courses to do so I did you know English Mass 1 I didn't do Mass 2 uh, <laughs> which is like Mass Mass 2 Mass 1 must be like Mass B I think in the old language yeah. Yeah. again it's all moving it's far too quick for me it's all too quick <laughs> um, and then I did so English Mass 1 Secretarial Studies Accounting multi-strand science and film and television and film and television was the muck around one where we actually got to use super 8 film and we would edit like physically edit so we're not doing that yeah. you took a strip of film not like what you're doing now you oh, took a strip of that. film you sent it away <laughs> you put it in a post pack it went to melbourne someone developed super 8 film sent it back to you you got it back three weeks later right you know how very timely <laughs> you know how when you're vodcasting you're like oh that's yeah. really bad. Yeah. Delete. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> there was none of that. You didn't even know it was really bad until three weeks later. Uh, or the sound didn't work or any of that kind of thing. Ooh, so nice. I did film and TV. It was my only HA in high school because it was my muck around subject. Yeah. So everything else was. So VHA, very high achievement. I'm speaking about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. No, no, don't worry. Like, <laughs> my, my school has the same system. Okay, so cool. So we're speaking the same language. Very high achievement, high achievement, sound achievement. I got VHAs in everything except for... Um, uh, film and TV where I got HA but wow. no one got a VHA I think only one or two people got a VHA but it was a very small school I went to I probably should mention that it was <laughs> it was Lowood so it wasn't your grammars it wasn't your nudgies it yeah. wasn't your your <laughs> terraces or even any of your catho um, systemic schools it was um, Lowood State High mm -hmm. and literally one of my colleagues is really really worried about the socio-demographic mm -hmm. Because he wants to make choices mm. about where he sends his child to. And he's all like, um, oh, no, the, I looked at the socio-demographic in index and it's only 940 and this one's 960. And, they should, and it's like, what? <laughs> Let me show you the yeah. socio-demographic of my school. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it has a seven in front of it. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I suspect I'm the only P person with a PhD that came out of that Ooh, school. Oh, star <laughs> student. So it's not exactly... Um, it's not grammar. Yeah. Which I assume you know what I mean when I talk about grammar, right? Yeah, Brisbane, like the private grammar, schools. Grammar girls, much. grammar boys. Yeah. yeah. So that was my high school. And then I came to uni uh, and choices, I filled out the little form. Had no idea what tertiary entrance score I was going to get. So we literally called it a TE score back then. I ended up getting, so a 960 in, 965 in the, that day, which translates... It turns out to about an ATAR of 94, 95. Okay, so that's a language you might understand. Yeah. Probably, I want to say OP3, OP4 oh, for the older ones. Nice, nice. nice. Um, and, uh, but we had a big problem actually in my school. We had a whole bunch of kids that got really good TE scores and they all went off to uni and they survived about a year and then they dropped uni. Uh, and there was a big question as to whether this was a problem around the way the student, the school was preparing their students for uni or just a generational change thing. I came, Lowood is a small country town. I went to school with a lot of German potato farmers. 
<laughs> right? Actually, technically lucerne and crops and sorghum and other things I don't really know, but lots of stuff you plant in the ground and you harvest it. But in the 80s, there was this transition of, hey, if I want to do anything, I've got to do more than just grade 10. Like you could get your junior certificate back in those days and that would get you a job and you'd be fine for life. But a lot of people started going to school to do their senior certificate, to do their senior year 12. And so consequently, a lot went off to uni, but a lot also dropped out of uni after the first year, which is you know, a waste of a year of their life. And it's a waste of the educational resources we spent for a year not training them to do anything. I stuck it through. I did a Bachelor of Commerce here at UQ. Wow. And then I did an honours degree. I didn't know what an honours was. In fact, I didn't know what a lot of things were. I went to, I came to uni and I thought that the libraries would have, you know, fiction books, you know, so you can yeah, go along and... me too. <laughs> and I'm like sitting there going, it's a big library. At high school, we had novels that I could borrow. This is a big library. There must be novels there somewhere. I think I may have gone up and asked for, you know, where's the fiction section? <laughs> uh, there is no fiction section. That's what Tawong Library is for. That's what the council libraries are for. If you want books, that's <laughs> where you go. But I did, um, I then trekked off to um, do my Bachelor of Commerce degree. And I went through, and back in those days, there were no majors. So I pretty much did them all. <laughs> now, I think there were two courses maybe I didn't do that were on offer. So you do like 24 courses for a degree and I did an extra two, and there are only really 26 in the offerings. That's more now. Um, so I mustn't have done, I want to say, uh, I think it may have, I think it may have been, which is ironic, the information system third level subject. I may not have done that. Um, actually, funny story. Funny? Hmm. So for context, I'm a lecturer in information systems. Yeah. I just took you through a walk through the magic park of my books, which include, you know, the original mathy how to do database courses. So I got a four. Wow, solid. That's equivalent <laughs> to a just pass. Fours <laughs> open doors, right? That's what we say. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, it's better. We used to have conceded passes in those days. Uh, so a conceded pass was you got a three. It'll count. You can graduate. Do not go on and do the extra advanced subjects on this because, you know, you suck at this. Yeah. Um, so nowadays a three would get you a supplementary exam. Yeah. And if you can't pass that, then you have to do it all again. But back in those days, it was a conceded pass. The four was four. Introduction to information systems. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the course I lecture now or have been lecturing for a while. Yeah, hopefully you've um, changed the course. As far as, as far as I'm concerned, it was a problem with the assessment model <laughs> ah. uh, on account of how my wife did the same course. So I met my wife ah, at a statistics lecture. Ooh. So I met her at a statistics lecture. Somehow she was more interesting than statistics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she doesn't like it when I say that for some reason. Um, of course, it also means I was more interesting than statistics. So we met her in the effectively the intro to statistics course that is in the BCom now. I think there is one. Uh, but back then it was a year long because they, nothing, firstly, when we did our BCom back then, they would say, look to your left, look to your right. One of you will not be here in a year's time. That was the motivational <coughs> speech in the very first introduction to accounting course. Damn. They, they were brutal back in the 80s. Yeah because it was that long ago. <laughs> um, and um, anyway, she got a seven in the information systems course. Wow. And she can't use computers even now. <laughs> so Ooh. I don't know how. Not a good measure. Remember, remember that this was in 1988. Uh, so in 88, computers were, they were kind of brutal. Uh, they did not work like computers do now. Uh, and so she literally, a few years later, managed to put... You remember floppy disks? Yeah. So she put one in upside down <laughs> and back to front and got it into the computer and then couldn't get it out <laughs> when it didn't work. And I'm like, you got a seven in that course that I got a four in. Yeah. Still Something's holding a grudge. Here. You got to hold on to the hatred. Yeah. 
<laughs> take and the that, love. <laughs> take that into a little ball and turn it into something productive, like a lifelong vendetta against yeah. poorly taught information systems courses. <laughs> Sorry, Errol. So Errol was a lecturer here. <laughs> Uh, and he and I ended up on a committee together a few years later. Uh, so anyway, I did honours. When I went to honours, I had no idea about the honours program. So I thought I was just going to learn more accounting standards. Turned out what I was going to learn was how to develop accounting standards and what their impact was on industry. Uh, so research. So there was a lot of discussion around research and proxies and uh, betas, beta scores, and error terms on regression models. Damn. Wait, so you decided to, um, I guess, major per se, like write your thesis on accounting? I actually did, yeah. Uh, oh, I did it on and what was that decision process like? You mean marketing, you know? Well, marketing was not, there wasn't even a thing. Oh, I wow. did commerce. There was, there, right, was, okay. there was one course, Introduction to Marketing, and there was no second course. Remember I said I did all the courses? Yeah. That's because there were hardly any. You could do three accounting, three financial accounting, three management accounting, three finance courses. So I did all those. You could do three information systems courses. I do remember my wife went to the third level management accounting course, mm -hmm. and it was being taught by a fellow whose name shall not darken the doors again. <laughs> But uh, he called her Sweet Pea. <laughs> Have you got a problem up the back there, Sweet Pea? Uh... And she never came back. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much for management accounting. You lost um, an analytical person who could <laughs> not put floppy disks into computers but would have made a great management accountant. As it turned out, she's also a great lawyer. Uh... Uh, so she ended up transferring to law and doing a law degree um, or doing commerce law. Um, so where was I? Um, so wait, how did you decide um, accounting out of... Oh, okay. So I wanted to be... I was good with computers. It was mm -hmm. kind of a natural thing. Mm -hmm. But the uh, computer systems, A, at the time, were not that advanced. And so what I wanted to be was hide my computing light under a bushel because then you would be, you know, the tech repair guy. Mm -hmm. So anybody who broke something, you would end up fixing. I didn't want that. I wanted to be a good accountant who was also good with computers. Mm -hmm. So I did my major, my, my honours thesis in management accounting. It was actually organisational behaviour, so people and accounting. So how do accounting and people all play together? So it was all about participation in the budget setting process. It was riveting read. <laughs> I had to read it because I wrote it. Uh, and then I had to read it again and again and again. And it's sitting on the shelf behind you there. It's one of those blue books at the back. Wow. Uh, wow! And it's printed on a dot matrix printer. I used WordPerfect 5.0. You don't even know what WordPerfect is. No idea. <laughs> it beat. It used to be better than Word. So Microsoft Word is everywhere. It used to be. Oh, WordPerfect is fantastic. Word per. Nobody <laughs> uses that. And then. That was the end of that. Microsoft took over everything with their packages, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, WordPerfect does exist still. It is only done by true diehards. But <laughs> WordPerfect 5.0 was the one that didn't have tables. So you know how you create a table in Word? Yeah. Have you ever tried to write a research paper without using a table? Oh, it's not possible. Okay. So you had to tabulate everything so you had to go tab tab tabity tab tab and then get your ruler out and go rule wow. <laughs> rule you hand drew everything and there's a graph in that document which was drawn by my wonderful wife my then girlfriend wow. i remember her drawing it out after i printed it out on the dot matrix printer yeah. on fine mode it took about five minutes to print each page true story yeah. <laughs> And, um, yeah, so that got printed out. So choices, I went to do my accounting. I went to do accounting. I wanted to be an accountant. I was a student CPA, member of CPA. Still am a member of CPA Australia. Um, and I ended up um, choosing to do my honours thesis in organisational behaviour and management accounting. Um, and then I graduated. Woohoo! And I had been to an interview with Carolyn Hess, who did her honours with me as well. She and I were up down to the final two. We were both doing honours together. Both got down to the final two for that job. And choices, they chose <laughs> Carolyn. 
nothing against that at the time. <laughs> they chose back. Carolyn. <laughs> and it was for the... Well, this comes back to that whole infinite possibilities careers thing, right? My career would have been very different if they had picked Carolyn or picked me yeah. over Carolyn. So Carolyn came up to me at graduation. I got my... Um, I, I, it, can't, it wasn't on a mobile phone. <laughs> I remember in my head I'm thinking, oh, I got a text and I got... But I didn't because this was 1991. There were no in mobile phones. Um, I think back then they posted your results on a wall. Uh, so they would post up on a notice board in JD's story. Actually, that's what they used to do. Privacy, what's that? Yeah. They'd put your student number and your grade beside the course code. And so I got a, I remember I got a five for scientific research methods. Mm -hmm. The lecturer who lectured me in that is Professor Peter Clarkson, who is here in the accounting discipline. Mm -hmm. And he and I just had our first PhD student together do their final thesis review yesterday. So oh. Peter and I are the advisors to that student. So he's got getting his PhD. He will get his PhD, I'm sure of it. <laughs> this is the final stage before it goes out to the examiners. So Peter gave me a five. Wow. <laughs> and you never let him forget, was that right? Uh, <laughs> I try to forget, to be honest. And I got a seven for legal studies and a seven. So there was a law honours course. There was a... And I got a seven for my thesis. And... Uh, there must have been another course there. Organisational behaviour, I would have got a seven for that. So I would have got seven, 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 five. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm remembering or carrying a torch or anything like that. Um, and the thesis and the research methods course were whole year ones, so they were like half your degree, half your honours year. So I graduated. Carolyn came up to me and said, hey, I've got a week's worth of work because she felt kind of guilty. She'd gotten the job. I didn't get the job. And so I went off and um, took the job that she was going to do. And it was a four-day job after Christmas. She wanted to take a bit of time off after Christmas before she started the new job that she got that I didn't. Oh, and what was that job about? It would have been graduate accountant or graduate management accountant at <laughs> the Queensland Electricity Commission. It was a government job. Oh, um, and life. Possibly. And um, comfortable life choices, I probably wouldn't have liked it. Although I do remember the time I went for the Telstra job, <laughs> I was doing participation in the budget setting process. Hello, I go in for the interview. So we use a tool, this was the interview question, we use a tool to make sure people spend money well. What is that? Now I had gone to bed at 2 a.m. writing the damn thesis. <laughs> slept in for my nine o'clock appointment. I woke up at 7.30 and had to rush to get there. And I'm like, uh, uh duh, <laughs> purchase orders, something. <laughs> so obviously the answer that they were looking for was budgets. And they were trying to give me an opportunity to talk about the thing that I'd obviously spent a year working on, but I didn't make the connection between my studies and practical life. I learned that lesson the hard way because I didn't, that was the second interview, and I didn't get any further than that. I think I got a phone call or a letter. That's what they did back then. Nowadays, they don't even send you emails. Um, anyway, Carolyn gave me a job at Churchy, which is how I know the grammars and the terraces. Because oh. normally, if you go to Lowood, you don't even know what you don't know. But yeah, I worked at Churchy for four days, became uh, four years. So I was there for four years and I left there as administration manager, must have been 97, to go to St. Margaret. So I had a whole career in not-for-profit educational institutions uh, and then realised that I needed to be 82 if I was going to get promoted any further. So I had, a, I had applied to be the business manager for the school and I was told, um, look, you're a bit young. I'm hiring someone who's 38. I was 28. We're hiring someone who's 38, I think he's a bit young. We're going out on a limb with him. And he came in and he had never worked in a private school before in his life. Wow. Had, Qualified. Had no idea about anything to do with private schools. Uh, and so I went hunting for a job downtown and I figured I could spend 10 years working for an accounting firm, come back if I still wanted to, and I'd still be fine. So I ended up Quitting that to go work in an accounting firm. I worked at Horworth. Uh, up on the shelf up there, there's that boomerang that I was talking about before. Mm, yeah. I was working there for about eight years. 
Actually, it was 10 years all up um, because Hallworth merged into BDO. So mm. I was, but by that stage, I was information systems consulting person. So I had gone off and done a master's of information systems from 96 to 2000. So I went, graduated, worked as an accountant for a while um, in the private school sector, and then went off and did my master's, used that to get into the accounting firm. And I was director there for about 10 years or so. Um, and then choices, had children, uh, couldn't work the 12 hour days anymore. Uh, so I threw the towel in on that and set up, my, set up my own company, started doing my PhD, and somehow ended up here in this office with books and typewriters and keyboards behind me. Wow, interesting. Um, so I ended up using the masters to transfer from like accounting to information systems to kind of formalize that experience. Yeah, and why was that? Information systems, as that, it, that Well, memory. as it turned out, um, I had qualified as a CPA and accounting is an amazingly flexible career, um, but it can get a little samey. <laughs> so by the time I'd done the 13th bank rec, I've kind of figured that that looked a lot like number one. So I went back and discovered that my bank recs were, you know, just, they were gonna be much the same. And if I could get, get them reconciling every month, that was my job. And I really wanted something a bit more interesting and engaging than that. And I really liked the problem solving aspect of work life. So I try to solve problems and use that experience expertise to turn that into something that solves a problem, uh, which is a lot of what I was doing because in the private, the, the not for private school, not for profit sector, there wasn't a lot of money for talent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you couldn't have a director of this and a director of that. You pretty much had to be a jack of all trades to try and solve problems. So, um, I went off to, I left that world of private schools to join the pub, the, the private, world. <laughs> well, the public accounting sector, public accounting firms. And so that meant that um, I wanted to do information systems consulting. So how do you use technology? How do you set up an accounting system? How do you govern your technology choices? How do you develop an IT strategy? And the master's degree that I did, we did a fair chunk of that kind of thing. And that degree was the Masters of Information Systems. It is pretty much the Master of Commerce majoring in Information Systems that I do as program lead now here. Yeah. Um, so I did that and my thesis was around databases. So if I have any one technical skill, it's around databases and SQL and using that to query and build databases. Um, and so that was a good signal to the market that, hey, I was an information systems person. So that's what I would do. I would go off and I would um, build databases, build information systems, think about people, process, technology. So here I am as a person coming in with a bit of technology. I had built a lot of tech along the way. I built technology that did everything they wanted to, yet no bugger would use it. <laughs> so really it wasn't a successful thing. And why was that? I'd focused too much on the technology. If all the technology worked, but the way they worked, used it, the process was alien to them or it just didn't work easily or the people weren't trained or were not accepting of the technology. Mm, yeah, yeah. So... Choices again, I then um, set up my own company. I did a bit of consulting through there. That was reasonably okay, but one of the goals was I had young children <laughs> and the young children were taking up a lot of time. So I was working at home just doing a bit of consulting, but I always wanted to do the PhD. I'd done the honours, I'd done the masters. I felt it was time to do the PhD. Why is that? You don't need it to... You don't, in Australia, in fact, in Australia, if you have a PhD in industry, I would probably hide it. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of negative. Yeah, it shows that you're like overqualified. They're Pretty a much. Bit to hire. They're a bit scared to hire you because they figure you don't have the practical bent. You're probably going to spend all day telling them how they have heteroscedasticity in their data <laughs> and they really need to think about their design of their instruments and perhaps we should spend two years getting that right. And industry is saying, you've got to lunchtime. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. 
Um, so they're a bit worried you're going to overthink it. They love master's degree. Industry loves a master's degree. I would say that there are some sections of industry that do really, really like PhDs. They are your big corporates, your government departments. The rest, there's a middle ground that thinks PhD, don't like it. And then there's another ground that goes, what is a PhD? <laughs> right? So there are those that love it and know what it is. There are those that have an idea what it is and hate it. And then there are those that neither know what it is and don't care. So if I was going back into private practice, I would actually de-emphasize the whole doctor thing. Uh, probably say I did something more useful, like for that four-year gap on my resume, instead of doing my PhD, I was in jail. <laughs> right? So four years, um, you've got a gap in your resume. Yeah. Uh, in private industry, that can... Um, yeah, they don't like the PhD so much. So you don't need a PhD to go off and get industry. Masters is good. I continue to believe, I'm sorry, um, that the best thing to do, well, okay, let me take it back a step. The first thing I'm sorry about is in terms of undergraduate studies, so you're a student here at UQ. Yeah. Um, a lot of students in my undergraduate classes, in my experience, I follow a thirds rule. So one third of the students shouldn't be there, <laughs> right? Yeah. They um, are doing something because mum and dad told them to do it and they'd really be much better off going and being an electrician. I am genetically 92% bogan, okay? So my cousins, auto electricians are mines. So my cousin is 20 <laughs> years younger than me and he owns more holiday houses and jet skis and he's got his own auto electrician business. He's doing fine. Yeah, he's doing great. He's doing great. He's living his, he's living his best life. And, um, um, and that is from saving his pennies from going off and working as an auto electrician in the mines, building up his own firm. He's not a PhD person. He's not even an undergraduate person. So there's a third of my students who'd be better off doing something useful. And you know what is great about a trade? You might be an auto electrician. But if you're an auto electrician, you know a refrigeration technician who can fix up your air conditioning. You know a diesel mechanic who can fix your $80,000 Land Cruiser when it has problems. You know a carpenter who can help you knock together the kitchen on the weekends. So you know people who can actually do stuff in your house. I can come around and help you look at your research model and maybe tell you that your construct is poorly defined. This is researchy talk. And it's great for research, but not good for getting your kitchen sorted. So if you want to have a good life, there's a third of my students who are kind of, they are never going to be a good accountant. They're going to be much better off doing a trade and they just haven't realized it yet. They probably aren't going to make it through the degree. For the meantime, they're kind of making it bad for everybody else. They're not doing something that they want to do. They should go do something they want to do. There's another third of students who are good for uni, but they're doing the wrong degree, right? So they should go, they should go, I would have said pre-COVID, backpacking around Europe for a year, right? Don't waste a year, don't build up that help debt. Um, go backpacking, fruit picking, do whatever the heck it is you want to do. For a year, work out what it is you want to do and then go to uni. You'll be a much better student. Then there's the third that have always wanted to do this degree. This is exactly what they want to do. Off they go. They're the ones that you want in your classroom, okay? Damn, I'm surprised that one third actually want to do what they're doing. You, you think I it's think too big? Yeah, I think it's too big. <laughs> well, then I've got to come up with like a, a rule of thirds and then... Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. So, um, yeah, but roughly, right? I can yeah. certainly categorise them into three is kind of where I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it, I guess it depends. I'd say some of the, like our advanced degrees that we have, um, those students tend to be at the OP21 level and those students tend to know what they want to do or the what ATAR 96-ish. Well, I can't speak the new language. Anyway, they are determined generally. But even then, you know, you go do like our BAFE degree. Yeah. Life is not set out for you in a lovely clean slate. 
you come in, you think you're going to be a merchant banker and a stockbroker and you do the BAFE degree and then you spend your first year on the job working for one of the big stockbrokers or Macquarie or one, someone like that and then you discover you hate it. Yeah. Uh, and that's really not terrific because what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so um, having that plan, oftentimes people that have the most rock solid plans are the ones that the plan doesn't work for, right? So flexibility, a little bit of chaos in the machine is not a bad idea. So um, getting back to my journey, PhD wise, yeah. um, I always wanted to do the PhD. I'd done the honours, I'd done the masters, I'd done all the prerequisites to do a PhD. I knew what I was kind of letting myself in for. My advisor knew that I knew, and so therefore I wouldn't be a painful student. Uh, so that kind of all happened along the way. And I ended up doing, he needed an industry person who had background in accounting and information systems who could deal with the professional accounting bodies because they were funding this research. Uh, and I had been chair of the IT Centre of Excellence for CPA Australia for a number of years. And accordingly, um, I knew all the players. I knew... Um, the Attorney General from, um, or the Auditor General from um, WA, because he sat on the on the Education Committee with me. So I was, I put my hand up. I volunteered to do all of these professional things along the way, uh, and I think just volunteering for things will help you understand what you want to do, and give you some idea as to where you want to go. For example, last week we had Indigenous students on scholarship here. So high schoolers, they're Indigenous, usually coming from a non-academic background, usually first in family. Like me, library, do they have a book? <laughs> uh, but more than that, not even knowing what a degree is, not even knowing what a university is. When you're first in family, you have no idea about all of those things. When you are the son or daughter of a judge on the Supreme Court, or your parents are anaesthetists or surgeons, you, you know, just your dinner, your discussion around the dinner table is going to just, you're just going to pick it up. But if you are, you know, your, your dad's a tire fitter and your mother works in a dairy farm, where are you going to learn about universities, right? You're just not. So these Indigenous students come in and I had said, I'd offered, I would give something back. I would do a session for these students. I could do cyber security, so hence my UQ cyber <laughs> shit. I could do cyber security. I could do information systems assurance. I could do data analytics, business analytics. I do have this hobby I do, public speaking. I could talk to them about how to do public speaking. That was the thing they went for, public speaking. They mm. wanted, I ended up doing an hour and a half session with those students last week on doing public speaking. And I got into that because I was director of accounting in an accounting firm in the late 90s. The world is full of accountants who can't speak well in front of a group, and I didn't want to be one of those, so I joined a public speaking organisation called Rostrum, and I've basically been with them ever since. And last night, for example, I went off to do um, the Carter Shield, which is a competition for Moreton Bay Boys College, Moreton Bay College, which is the girls' equivalent, the Girls College, and Iona, three really good public speaking schools. And, you know, I was one of the judges. It was me and three students, all of whom are like in their first year of uni, I think. Um, and, you know, we had, um, so seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, six grades, three schools. So we had 18 speeches, <laughs> averaging about four minutes each. And you had to judge them all. So I had to rank them to work out who won. So that was my night last night. I had to drive to Winner Manly, uh, which is about an hour from here, 45 minutes in peak hour, and sit there for <laughs> listening to 18 speeches. And then we had to, as a panel, judge. And that's purely been part of my wanting to just be able to public speak in front of a group. Because uh, I was horrible at it, really horrible at it back in undergrad. 
And by the end of undergrad, I was still really horrible. <laughs> but you need to be able to speak in meetings. You need to be able to present to groups. Uh, and you need to be able to structure your thoughts for job interviews and things like that, which I'm terrible at. But what I did find was when I applied my rostrum thinking to job interviews, that became really good. For example, when you were going for a job interview, and again, this is a kind of those pathways, choices, serendipitous aspects of your life. How will you fit into this organisation? You can blather for a bit, but you know what feels really good is when you have a bit of a plan, <laughs> right? So what you do is past, present, future. So in the past, I have done these things. And now I'm looking for the next challenge and I see the future with you. And then you shut up, right? You stop talking. You've, you've talked about what you said you were going to do. And if they want to know more, they will ask you. But if you start out with, I'll answer that by considering three things. Uh, where I've been, where I am, where I'm going to. And your company fits really well with that. And let me explain. One, two, three. You've done. It's a structured answer. It's a structured response. It has a beginning. It has an end. You sound really smart because you made this up on the way. Or you can do local, national, global. I want to do something locally here in Brisbane. I want to make change in Australia. And that feeds into global change. I want to recycle coffee cups, <laughs> right? How can I be better for the planet? Well, I can do something for myself by looking after coffee cups. I could do something more... Um, at a higher level than just me by, you know, setting up a coffee recycling station in the kitchenette area. Uh, I could lobby the cafes. But on a national level, I could be part of a group that uh, stops people using plastic lined coffee cups, which apart from disposable masks are probably our biggest environmental issues at the moment. Lots of plastic in those, which is why they can't be recycled in the normal way unless you buy the um, compostable, compostable ones. And masks also have all of that filters and stuff that's just not good for wildlife. So local, national, global, you go, just keep expanding. So you can answer those questions in job interviews. Yeah, damn, damn. So then I went off and did my PhD and yeah, that wait, was, another thing. Yes. So you had kids. So a lot of yes, people did, at yes. that time, they're like, oh, man, you know, time to settle down. But was it something, I don't know, like you're looking more for a challenge? Because PhD is no small feat. Like you are, <laughs> it's like a full-time job plus those extra hours at home. Plus yes. you're consulting. So yes, no one, <laughs> yeah, generally people, um, yeah, they would tend to choose the more easier path. It's interesting because my um, best mate, Former best mate from high school, not Ooh, sure. Former best mate. Ooh. Well, <laughs> we've drifted apart. People drift. Yeah. Uh, and he had, he got, so what university um, score did you get? You had an OP? Three. You got an Same OP of three? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Following in your footsteps. <laughs> um, and so, so you use OP, right? Yeah. So back in my day, it was tertiary entrance score. I got a 965, yeah. okay, which is kind of like the ATAR. It sort of starts at the top and moves its way down. Um, and he got like a 620, mm -hmm. which would be in an OP language, it'd be probably like 18. Ooh. And he went back to uni back to high school because back then you had to repeat the whole year 12 thing. So he went back and repeated year 12 <clears throat> and his second go round, he got like a 680. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so an OP, OP of 14, which still didn't, it wouldn't have even been 14. It's probably an OP 20, 18 or something like that. Ridiculous. Didn't go to uni. F had a hard time getting a job. Couldn't get a job um, for a long time, mostly because he's an idiot. Um, and then um, he's worked his way through and then discovered, you know, my, um, I want to do something more. And but he didn't have kids at that stage, but he did um, uh, have a very, very important social life to him. So he wanted to, he got an offer to a Bachelor of IT degree. Remember, he got a really low entrance score. What is great about Australia is you get second chances. But he still said, 
no to that because his free time was very valuable to him and it would be way too much work to study. And he's still complaining about his job. This was like 13 years ago. <laughs> he would have had the new job, the new career, the new everything eight years ago. Um, I think he was worried, oh, I'll be in my... Th he would have been in his 40s when he graduated and, you know, why would I put myself through all that on you know, be in my 40s. And a, you're not nearly dead when you're in your 40s. <laughs> and B, if you don't do this thing, you will still be in your 40s and doing what you're doing now and just as unqualified. So you need to think about your choices here. So PhD was kind of the natural progression for me. It means I get to do what I do in the university here. Uh, it gives me the chance to mentor research students and, you know, uh, undergraduate, postgraduate students trying to do start off on their career. So I find um, <clears throat> the PhD is basically a price of entry to that from a university perspective. Oh, so you um, did a PhD in the mind, like with, with the goal of becoming a lecturer? Um, it, was, it was one of the choices that would have been available to me. Um, I was originally going to go back into consulting. Yeah. Um, and 2020, 2021, <laughs> and that, well, I would get two cards printed up, <laughs> one with the quals and one without, right? Uh, but in, in university land, it's important to put the qualifications on the business card. In industry land, I would hide them. Uh, so I ended up, yeah, just, it was something I'd always wanted to do. I'd already done two theses. Uh, one was a survey, one was an experiment, so my final PhD was interview transcript uh, qualitative analysis. Ooh. So it was kind of the full experience then. So I've done, not all of them, but I've done a range, the quant, the qual analysis, the theory building, which was kind of good and important for a PhD. Um, so I went off and did all that, not because I needed to, plenty of people have perfectly fine lives Exhibit A, my cousin, um, <laughs> with the auto electrician business, um, but it was what I wanted to do, and so off I went. So it was kind of like, oh, I haven't done that before, try to do it, because it seems like, um, I think it's quite cool that, you know, you did your thesis on like other different methods, and then you want to choose something completely new, but I think um, a lot of people, they might have the thought that I want to play to my strengths, I'm going to keep doing the same thing, and okay. that's how... Playing to your strengths is not a bad thing. So if you were, you know, this tall, yeah. like my daughter, she's not tall, <laughs> and you wanted to, you know, have a career in basketball, yeah. it's probably not playing to your strengths, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, tall person, small person, why would you put them up against each other? That's why we have, you know, bantam weights in boxing, this kind of thing. Um, you definitely need to play the game that you're good at rather than playing the game that you're bad at, okay? Mm -hmm. But if you want a research career, it is helpful to have that qual, quant, um, different ontological perspective. So I'm doing, in actual fact, both of my research areas at the moment are really in the qualitative stage because qualitative is great for building theory, right? You can talk to people and understand how things are working, and that is necessary when you are trying to understand a new problem. And guess what? Most of the things in information systems are new problems. We're always inventing new technologies. Things don't necessarily work according to tick boxes. Now, once you have built the theory, you need to test the theory. And that's where experiments and surveys can really start fleshing that out. So it becomes this kind of lock step. I need to know more about it, so qual. I know more about it, let's test it, survey. And you can kind of ratchet up the body of knowledge, your understanding of the topic you're trying to tear apart and rebuild. And that's why it's important to have a wide range. Um, it is probably important from a publications perspective to focus on one method or perhaps one topic area of interest to you that is still growing. Participation in budget setting, my <laughs> honours thesis, not such a big topic anymore. Hasn't been since pretty much the time I published that <laughs> <laughs> thesis. Um, so I'm doing cyber and artificial intelligence now. Oh, very, very trendy. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> trendy is not something that often gets associated with me, but um, cyber <laughs> is um, so cyber is less about the techo geeko firewall plugging holes in things. It's more about cyber governance or cyber resilience. How do I keep my organization running given that cyber attacks are going to keep happening, right? How do I make my organization able to recover, get better at doing the cyber resolution, right? Not necessarily, you try to prevent as much as you can, but even if you, you know, prevent 98% of cyber attacks, that still leaves 2%. How do I manage and respond to that? That's kind of the cyber area that I'm thinking about. So there's a mix of tech, people, and process in that. So it's an information systems research area. The artificial intelligence is actually artificial intelligence and education. So, you know, I could spend hours responding to your emails over the period of a week, or I could have an AI responding to your emails, right? So you've got a question for me as a lecturer, and the artificial intelligence drafts an email and sends it off to you saying, does this answer your question? That is technically possible. The question then becomes, should we do it? And that's the question I wanna know, right? Is there's an ethics question in that, but there's also an effectiveness question in that. Um, if you're asking questions that the computer can answer, maybe you need to ask harder questions or do your own research, or maybe I need to build my course so that you can answer those questions yourself without having to ask. There's that consideration. Um, so I'm looking at those kind of things. I could use AI to mark your essays, yeah. um, but then people will do, people are smart. People are two things. They are smart and they are lazy, right? So A, they, if they are smart, they will not do things they don't get good results from. So they'll do it once or twice. They'll stop doing it after that. They learn. They're also lazy. They try to get as m the best outcome for the least work. Um, so for example, if you know that I am using an artificial intelligence to mark your essay, are you going to write an essay that a person can read and understand, or are you going to try and write an essay that is better for the artificial intelligence to mark? And if you know that the artificial intelligence is doing the marking, you're probably going to write something that the AI understands. Me as a person reading it might go, wow, I have no idea what you said, yet the AI is saying it's great. Why is that? It's because the person has written something coded for the AI's algorithm. Mm, that's very interesting. And so what then people do, because they are smart and they are lazy, um, but they also want to get good grades, is they write two essays, right? And this is a thing for CVs as well. They write an essay using white font, for the computer to read. So if you put it in white, your person can't see it, and then you have pictures over the top that have black font, mm. and the lecturer can see that. And if you're doing applying for jobs, you write a CV in white text that will get through the artificial intelligence scorer because people feed your CV through an, an algorithm to score you. So you write the white text so that it scores well on the AI and you have black text so that when they, the computer says, hey, this is great, you hand it over to the person, they can read something that is designed for a person. Interesting. So is it that like in that one sheet of paper, there's the, the two fonts on it? Mm. Oh, they can well, layer it. You can layer it. So the computer oh, yeah. can't read the picture, but it can read the font, the text oh. you see. So yeah. you, t you insert the other bit as a graphic and then you just give them a PDF and they can't tell the difference. If, if a canny lecturer or um, a HR person knows what they're looking for, they will be able to see it, but they have to pick your CV up and have a close look at it. And if they're doing that, you've already won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because my big problem here with artificial intelligence, for example, is using it to filter out all of these CVs that don't. Um, match up to anybody. So anyway, I mean, those choices and things like that, I'm not sure whether we've gone through all of the choices, but, you know, as you are making choices, you're kind of closing off some options and opening up others. I mean, if I hadn't done, you know, maths one back in grade, well, if I'd chosen in grade eight not to do advanced maths, I then wouldn't have been able to do maths one in um, high school 
which meant I couldn't do Bachelor of Commerce because you need math to do BCom. And then, and then, and then, and then. So, you know, little choices, butterflies in the Amazon, you know, all of that, those choices sort of widen up or close off opportunities for you. So for me, choices come around to giving yourself a kicking the can down the road, to be honest, if you're not sure what you want to do, the third, a third, a third, kick the can down the road so that when you leave that decision to when you have to make it. So, you know, in grade 11 and 12, don't pick the low level English that won't let you get to university because that's a bad idea. Fortunately, you don't have to go back and repeat like my mate had to do. Nowadays, you've got pathways. You can go do makeups. And one of the people last night at that Carter Shield, uh, he is working as a lab technician. He wants to go to uni, but he didn't do chemistry. And he needs to do chemistry to do the degree that he wants to do for the lab. Don't do, take, don't lock off choices unless you're absolutely sure that they're not what you want to do. And I suppose I probably would have liked to have done physics, chemistry, bio, because I'm probably, as it's turned out, more scientific -y, more researchy, and those are kind of natural fits for that. But at least I did multi-strand and have a base understanding, because we didn't do a lot of research stuff in my undergrad. We did in honours. Um, kick the can down the road for your choices. Uh, and then the other thing, I think, is, you know, volunteer for things. Take on opportunities. Sometimes... You're going to be overcommitted. PhDs and small children and consulting uh, and personal crises with health or whatever it might be. But volunteer to do these things. If you can't do them, people will understand if you pull out if it's a volunteer position. But take on board, volunteer, take advantage of opportunities to write things, to speak about things, because those are really critical parts of anybody's career. I'm going to have to write something and communicate it. I'm going to have to talk about it and communicate it, all of these things. Um, take advantage of opportunities, volunteer for things. I volunteered for the Centre of Excellence with CPA and I learned how to run meetings, published dozens of, I think probably dozens, literally, um, articles in the National Journal so people know who I am. Uh, and you just become a better writer, volunteer to speak at things because you know what, you become a better speaker. Interesting. Have we covered some of the grounds? I mean, we've we talked about typewriters and keyboards and other things yeah. like that. I did motor. I do motorbiking. I ride Ooh. a motorbike. Uh, I did have a I have a thing for old things. Hence, a 1934 typewriter and a 1964 How many typewriters. Up to date? Was it nine now? Seven now. I've got one on a promise, <laughs> <laughs> and I am looking for an Olympia SM9, which means nothing to you, but yeah, typewriter right. aficionados will know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. And I had a, so those are old. My, I had, my first motorbike was from 1980. So I had to learn how to fix motorbikes Ooh. or at least how to get it back running on the side Seems of the like road. It wouldn't bong. hands on after all. <laughs> <laughs> I did manage to, um, I remember I sliced my finger open um, removing the fuse when it blew in wooden bong on that motorcycle. Ooh. It must have been about that time I decided to get something made this century. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I do do all those kind of things. Yeah. And yeah. fox terriers, remember those? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so rules of life. <laughs> I still have, I have one fox terrier at home at the moment. And on the weekend, I managed to, I was fixing a gate, but I was, it was fixed and it was just resting, stopping her from going through that area. <sighs> do things when you want to do them. Don't do them because you have to. Um, is possibly something particularly on public holidays <laughs> so I was in a bad mood a foul mood and opened up the gate um, vigorously as is my want and of course it didn't have a hinge on it and it flew Ooh. and then it fell on my fox terrier and broke <laughs> her little toe in her paw uh, do you want to know how much a vet costs on a public holiday uh, and six to eight weeks to cure to mend a broken bone in the foot of a dog so um, wow. yes <laughs> I enjoyed that. So choices, focus on the job you're doing now because I was actually thinking about another job I had to do. So I had like three jobs I had to do, none of which I wanted to do and pushed open the gate and it fell on her. 
not thinking about, you know, I'm actually down here to fix that gate. Should have focused on that because I would have remembered not to go whoosh because it went flying and fell on the dog. Haven't heard screaming like that in a long time. Oh, never had a dog scream before. Yeah, you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> he was very much in a yelpy mood. Yeah. Wow, we'd and go we, near Michael for like two weeks. <laughs> we got the x-ray and um, yeah, it's a very clean break on her paw. So she's a very sore and sorry dog. But yes, um, yeah. you know, stay true, got the dogs, got the typewriters, because I learned on typewriters at school, the secretarial studies, shorthand, typewriting. Typewriting, copy texting, copying out things and being able to type at 120 words a minute. I know people on their keyboards nowadays will go onto websites and you know have little type-offs and they think they're really <laughs> clever because they can type at 140 words a minute for you know a minute come back when you can do that for two hours straight oh. like their old timers used to on respect <laughs> on very old machines yeah. so yeah fun times yeah that's cool and i do have a bunch more questions that Go i want to ask you yeah so um wait let's first start with the phd so i remember yeah. when you visited my class you're like you wrote a phd and then you're like never again but then you wrote a few more was that right well no i wrote the honors degree honors ah. thesis and then said ah. never again I wrote the master's thesis, never again. PhD, not going to be an academic, yet here I am. Um, and what happened? Well, things changed over time. Uh, what changed? You forgot the pain. <laughs> what, forgot the pain. Forgetting the pain is a big step. But three times. <laughs> I'm a slow learner. Um, <laughs> I'm a good writer uh, and good researcher. Um, particularly good... I'm probably good at um, going through a lot of literature and synthesizing it out into something that is a model of how everything works and how it all plays together. So for my PhD, I took three theories and tried to reconcile them. And I've got this, <laughs> this wonderful vi visual graphic in Visio, and it's layered so you can click on buttons and you can see bits of the theory falling away and then they all blend together which became my research model, which became my theory. Mm. Okay, so I'm very good, I think, at representing visually, if I have a graphics tool, because my drawing is hopeless, I can't even do stickmen. But, um, <laughs> Can draw tables, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm very good at drawing tables. Well, actually, my wife is the artist one. That's why she had to draw the curve. So I can do the lines because mm. typewriting and accounting set you up for being able to, you know, rule your lines. Mm. But yeah, no, anything with a bend in it, not good. <laughs> um, so she drew the little bell curve that I needed in my graph. But um, I used OmniGraphle and Visio to have layers to represent my stuff. And I'm very good. And I noticed that in honours, I would often, you know, here are three papers and I would summarise them in text, but then I would have a graphical representation of them. And it would be a Venn diagram or it would be probably a portfolio of, I would think of all of the things you learn about in accounting and governance, less of you must do this and more of here are a portfolio of things you can choose to use for your business depending on the type of business it is. So you can have a budget committee, you can have an audit committee, but you don't have to have an audit committee and you don't, certainly don't have to have everything. So I would kind of represent these things in that way. Um, what made me go on and do the... PhD and the Masters, even though all the pain, um, partly because I knew I could, partly because it was the right time of my life because I could, although we talked before about having small kids and PhDs, the, tr the thing that a PhD allows you is the flexibility to, you know, you can work from midnight till dawn if you want, um, you can time shift, whereas if you're working a nine to five job, that's a lot harder. And you could work weekends when my wife was not working and vice versa mm -hmm. so you could yeah. do things during the week if you needed to yeah cool i'm also kind of curious about the process so is it like um no matter like how passionate you are there is like going to be a time where you like hate what you're doing so i'm kind of wondering like what especially... often happens is you don't often hate your thesis because <laughs> if you hate your thesis then you're in a bad place but what you do find is you find everybody else's thesis to be really, really interesting. 
<laughs> much more interesting than your own. So what you should do is work on their thesis and they should work on yours. <laughs> then, of course, you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, but um, you, the, the, in terms of the process of your PhD, um, so there's actually literally a thing we refer to as gap spotting. Yeah, okay? yeah, I know that. So there's a spot in the literature. You've got to go find out what's missing in the literature and you're going to fill it. So what you have is you end up, um, there's a, I don't know if you talked about this one or have know about it, but there's a paper called by Locke and Golden Biddle, which basically talks about all oh, of the yeah, gaps. Oh, yeah, i read that. Yeah. Okay, cool. I haven't. Oh. Um, I've read the bits. Um, so um, there are, basically there are within literature, within domain things. So you can, within a domain, you can add to the body of knowledge there. You can go across domains and you can add to the body of knowledge there. You can make better constructs. So you can, you know, oh, I am interested in, so my PhD student yesterday, digital intensity. I'm interested in the digital intensity of organizations. What have people written about it? Well, they've written all these things, but they haven't really defined what it is. So let's define digital intensity to be something better, to be a bit more clear. So you define that. That's a theoretical contribution. That's a gap. How do we measure digital intensity? We have an instrument to measure digital intensity. This is an instrument. It's a gap. Uh, you can say, well, you know, in this body of literature, we've talked about digital intensity and we're going to um, use it in another way somewhere else. Um, so in my first thesis, I extended the domain, so the honours thesis, I extended the domain of the um, research. So it was budget process, setting process. So it was set in Canada with a bunch of retail companies um, how we go about setting our budget. So participation in the budget setting process. I took exactly that and replicated it in Australia. So I had to do the same research. I added a measure to the instrument, a question to the instrument. Um, and because I did a lot of theory that said, oh, yeah, we're missing a variable from that questionnaire. So let's add that. So that's an, that's extended the theory and then it moved it from Canada to Australia. So you're extending the domain. My master's thesis uh, took a linguistic theory around ambiguity of language. So there was a taxonomy for ambiguity of language. And then I took that and said, well, here are the different types of ambiguity in language. We apply that to a question that someone asks, a business question. So I might say to you, give me a report of our good customers for the month. And you have to work out what, what's a customer, what is good, right? And there's ambiguity in that. Because if I, you know, it's that time of the month again, I need to follow up on the good customers. Can you give me a list of the good customers? By saying good, I actually mean bad, <laughs> right? These are the ones I have to follow up because they haven't paid their bills. They haven't paid for the invoices that we sent them last month. They said they'd do this. They said they'd do that. I can stress that in different ways. So a computer can't necessarily pick up on that. Ambiguity in language probably comes back to my rostrum public speaking thing. I basically took this linguistic taxonomy of linguistic ambiguity took that to a question and said, how ambiguous is that question? What types of ambiguity are there? And so there are, there's syntactical, there's lexical, there's pragmatic ambiguity. Um, for example, um, so you know the old oracles of Greece, you know, the fortune tellers? Yeah. And so the kings would say, you know, there was, a, there was a famous, I want to say it was King of Thebes or somewhere, but basically uh, he said, if I go to war with Persia, uh, what will happen? And the answer came back. If you go to war with Persia, a mighty empire will be destroyed. Whose? Exactly. Whose empire? So he goes off, trots off, has a battle with Persia, gets completely killed. Well, decimated because he then comes back to the Oracle and said, wait a second, you said a mighty empire would be destroyed. And yeah, it was your own. <laughs> <laughs> so ambiguity. So you then take that theory from one different domain, put it into another context, and what does it mean for this whole communication discussion around 
asking questions of databases. Uh, and particularly the context of this was I write an email, send it to you, you're the programmer, the database programmer, I'm the business expert, you have to interpret what I wrote. You have none of the visual cues, you haven't had my voice, my inflective ambiguity, uh, you don't quite know what a customer means because is a customer someone who bought something? Is a customer someone who is going to buy something but hasn't bought something yet? It's, it's ambiguous. That's your theory extension. My PhD took um, a fairly poorly developed theory uh, and took that theory and because it was just an initial draft, right? This is how this thing works. Here's some boxes, here's some arrows. When this happens, then that happens. And then I defined the constructs better, pulled them apart. So one of the things is time with the tool. So you have to understand how long is time? Answer, two years. Because uh, this is all about de-skilling. When I'm giving someone a tool, how long does it take for them? If the tool does the work they used to do, how long does it take for them to forget how to do it without the tool? Answer, about two years. Um, what is a tool? And in my case, this is an intelligent tool, an artificial intelligence that helps you do audits. So how intelligent is the tool? Right. So it needs to be an intelligent tool, not just a tool. So I took the, it would have been three boxes and turn that into like eight circles using that theory development discussion. And I think keeping yourself motivated is by wanting to understand how this whole problem works and try to answer it. Mm -hmm. Hence the importance of research questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm kind of curious about how enjoyable is the process because I can imagine if I were to do a PhD year one, I can't wait for this to be finished, right? And so it'll be like... <laughs> if you're feeling like that in year one, you're not going to like years two, three, and probably four. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm wondering, is it like, a, I don't know, like 80% it's like, oh man, I have to get this done. And 20% it's like fun and exciting or what does it kind of feel? Um, I think you have to A, gamify it a bit. Yeah. Okay, so you have to give yourself points for mini goals. The PhD process is good because it's got milestones along the way. Confirmation, mid-candidature review, final thesis review, examiners. It's, and those are all about a year apart, with the exception of examiners. That should only be about three months. Um, gamify, things like, you know, I wrote a page today. Unfortunately, with PhDs, you can be really, really productive and go backwards in your word count in a day because you just deleted a whole bunch of stuff that you realized no longer counted. So you have days where you write a thousand words and the next day you delete 2,000. It's a better thesis, but you don't feel like you're getting anywhere. Um, I think being hyper clear, if you're doing a PhD, the trick to getting through it in a timely fashion is being hyper clear on your research question don't change the research question on the way. Because if you do, you're going to have a bad day. You've got to, your research question is the thing that drives everything, right? So, um, you know, what is the impact? So I'll go with uh, my PhD students some. What is the relationship between the digital intensity of an organization and their effective tax rate, their ability to avoid tax? So he's been looking at all of the digitally intense organizations of the world and what does that mean for how much tax they pay so you would you know google and amazon and Alp, apple and all of those companies he then had to work out you know what does digital intensity actually mean how do i measure it how do i have a practical measure of it because i might have a theoretical way of measuring it but oh my god so he's had the same research question since day one Things have moved around. The way he's measured the hypotheses have moved around. The hypotheses themselves, the theory, have stayed the same. I think um, recognising early on that first year is, is just scattergunning, right? It's, I'm going to do all these things. Uh, we would normally, in the business school, expect people to do a lot of um, you know, research skills building. Do the quant course, do the qualitative course, understand the research methods. During the course of the year, you develop a research proposal. That's your confirmation. You are then executing that research proposal for the next two years of your PhD. Mm -hmm. um, and that's your plan. That is your process, that research proposal. Now, people go to confirmation 
and their PhD may bear no resemblance to that initial research proposal. I am aware of people who rewrote their entire PhD after their final thesis review. And the trick here is that the word final is meant to mean final. <laughs> it's meant to be, that's it. Uh, shouldn't be rewriting the thing from scratch. If you are going to gather data, uh, so new data, which often information systems work is new data, that involves interviews with people and or surveys or experiments perhaps. Um, and so you can't be reframing your question once you've started on the data gathering. So you've really got to have, this is the question I want to explore because otherwise when you go to run your experiment, when you run your interviews, and then you say, oh, gee, I wish I'd asked this question. Well, you've got to chuck it all out and start again. <laughs> uh, this is important when it comes to um, your PhD process, making sure that you have um, a question that is the foundation of your PhD and you are planning and developing it. That's your research proposal. So you develop a, a theoretical model or a research model rather, and then you say, this is how I'm going to test it. I propose to test it in this way. That's why you have a confirmation that says, hey, <laughs> is this really going to work? And you get, you know, five people with PhDs to say, hey, yeah, no, nah, that's not a great idea, uh, which happened with mine. I was going to do a survey of 5,000 people. Never did that survey. <laughs> it never <laughs> happened. Uh, I misunderstood my level of influence over what I could and could not get and just how long it would take to do that. So I just did qualitative interviews. I'd already done a survey, so I didn't really need that grounding. Um, and then the MCR is just a, the mid-candidature is just a check-in point. The final thesis review is when you should have a full thesis that other people can go off and, and take a look at. A thesis itself should be roughly 150 to 250 pages, depending Ouch. on what discipline you're doing. <laughs> You know what's ouch? Okay. Ouch is when you write 250 pages and your supervisor says, no, get rid of all that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's ouch. Yeah. Um, my honours thesis was 100 pages plus references. And for those that are wondering, it shouldn't have been that long. <laughs> it should have been 100 pages, including references, including appendices. So it should have been half the size, which probably explains why I tore my hair out for the entire yeah. year. <laughs> So if you take a look, you'll see my, see the, the, part, the, the very first one is yeah. my participation. So grab that out. Nice. So that's 1991. Wow. It says so right there. <laughs> okay. And indeed, it is participation in the budget setting process, a critical look at the approach adopted by Aranya. Wow. So that is my uh, honours. This is my PhD right? <laughs> so the PhD is thinner wow. and the PhD is a whole lot more work. But there's a lot of carrying on with that one, a lot of extra. And the masters, grab the masters, the 2000. There's two copies. Wow, two copies. Uh, one was my grandparents, but they passed away. So it ended up with me. Yeah. Um, and um, so with my, I think you'll find that the PhD is double-sided. Yeah, wow. that's, that makes a difference. Okay. Uh, but the masters... Oh, it is all one-sided. And see, notice that wonderful dot matrix printing. Oh, <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> but I do have tables in my masters because by then you could actually do lines ah, on computers. I know, right? <laughs> Nothing like Word 97. Um, yeah. So the, um, the reason I've got these out is my master's thesis finishes on page 43, right? So that's an entire study. So that's the actual bit that matters. That's all the extras. <laughs> and my uh, master's supervisor, Dr. Paul Bowen, who passed away a few years ago, was adamant that thou shalt write very concisely. <laughs> Thou shalt not have passive voice. You will write very clearly. Pronouns are the work of the devil. You will not have a pronoun. So an entire thesis without a pronoun. There is no it, he,
he, she, it's not there. Because that would be, remembering the topic of my thesis, ambiguous. <laughs> so you don't use pronouns. So the idea was that your master's thesis is a paper that you could send to a journal for publication. Okay, A PhD should be three of those that you could send to a journal, because you do three studies. And an honours thesis should never see the light of day in a journal if it's an honours thesis. <laughs> Not quite, but um, yeah. taking a 100-page monograph and turning it into a 14, 15-page journal article would be <laughs> a Herculean task <laughs> and perhaps not worth it. Um, if your honours thesis is worthy of um, publication in a journal, you possibly should be thinking about PhDs. Oh, right? Yeah, yeah. That's so, uh, and then, of course, the other thing you can do is when you write one of these things, these are quite theoretical and they are, you know, academic you can write a version that would work for industry. And that's where places like The Conversation and a few papers and things like that can be worthwhile. Yeah, nice. But also you want to get into the juice of doing a PhD. So, the juice of doing a PhD? Yeah, oh, so gosh. tell me about the times where, I don't know, you've wanted to quit or maybe you've doubted. This would be very useful for people who might be, you know, considering pursuing. So to me, um, probably every day. <laughs> Right? Oh. Um, so you have to have a goal for the day that you're going to do. You also have to reward yourself with time off because PhDs can just take all day, all weekend, all holidays, Christmas Day, uh, all of that. Um, usually there's a crisis of some kind. Yeah. And realistically, a PhD is a series of hurdles. This was the advice that was given to me by my advisor. A series of hurdles, right? A series of jumps that you have to make. And as you get through each jump, you look forward to the next jump. Don't look at the end of the race. Look at the next jump that you have to make. So if the next jump is write that chapter, let's write the chapter. Minimum viable product. What would work as that chapter? What's the minimum that it has to do? Here is an outline and let's write. Don't try and write the whole thing in one go. Write a really bad version of it and then make a better one. But once you've got a full draft you can do something with it, right? Don't kid yourself that you write that first version and it's terrific, because it's not. <laughs> it's usually pretty terrible. Um, so why, let's start with the goal of writing a terrible chapter, because you know I can do that. Yeah. I can write a terrible chapter. But once it is written, it's written. Um, and then you can move things around. And what I found, I'm an outliner. So, because the thesis is writing, so it's all about the writing. So outline, points, structures, headings, what you're going to do and talk about in this chapter. And think about what is the goal of this chapter? How does it advance my research question? Okay, address the research question. Because if it doesn't address the research question, why is it there? So... I would actually write, so in the PhD, so in the PhD, uh, I would always start a book chapter, or so a chapter of a thing, with a paragraph at the beginning. So here. Hmm. So here's a paragraph. This chapter presents the research method used to address the research question of this study. What's this chapter about? The research method used to address the research question. It's got a purpose that links back to the research question. It provides a research design, which then links to the next chapter. The research design presented in this chapter, which is the title of the chapter, provides the basis of the data analysis findings and implications of future research presented in chapter five and chapter six. Cohesion. It links to the next two chapters. I would write, it's currently two paragraphs. The next chapter is signposting. This chapter is organized as follows. But So it's got all of the headings and everything you do. And so the very first thing I would do is write like a full page, page and a half. That would be the intro bit. And it would repeat all of the bits that are going to be addressed. So I would have a paragraph devoted to research strategy and approach, research strategy. And I would just have the key points in there. And that was my first bit. And that stayed there until I sent it off to the readers at my final thesis review 
who proceeded to say, Michael, you're being very repetitive. You don't need all this gumph. Why have you got it there? <laughs> and I said, well, I think it makes it more clear. And they said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> so they won. It got deleted. But it didn't matter because, and that was like 14 pages out of my thesis right there. Um, it didn't matter because I had used that to structure the rest of the chapters anyway. So I wrote effectively a minimum viable product, a page and a half for the chapter. And then I expanded that. And every day, you know, can I write three paragraphs today? And the insanity of it is, is that writing three paragraphs in a day is a good day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in terms of the process, the juicy bits, um, we had a study buddy group, and oh. I still advocate that. And we would meet every, um, Friday, every Monday. Every Monday we would meet at 10 a.m. because Rebecca would always sleep in. Uh, she was a night owl. So we would meet at 10 a.m. for coffee because, you know, 10 a.m. Monday we're going to do coffee anyway. And we would sit for an hour. And we would normally, it would just be a standing appointment. And so you need a support network. Right? It might be an individual work, but it is not alone. You need people to bounce ideas off. And we would, we had people from multiple disciplines. We had management, we had marketing, we had information systems, we had people from HR. So we had a fairly broad church of people. And what we would do is it was a structured meeting. Do you know anything about agile information systems development? Uh, is it like where you have like a stand-up meeting? Bingo, then... stand-up meeting. So uh, what did you do last week? Oh, yeah. What are your blockages? What stopped you from getting through? So you said you'd do all this work. You only did this much. No judgment, but why? Mm. Understand why. Was it because you set two big goals? Usually. Um, and then, so what I did last week, what my blockages were, what are my goals for next week? And we would just do all that. And we go around and people would write down on the little task list what they were going to do. And I miss that kind of structure, actually, because mm -hmm. then you would come back accountability and say to people, hey, I did it. I did finish off that book chapter or I got the introduction or whatever it might happen to be. And so we would go through this big chat back and forth um, after we'd been around the table and go deep into an issue. And it might be, you know, my advisor, because this is the usual problem. <laughs> I've got, when I do a PhD, I've got a couple of advisors. Now, I had one advisor, I had two advisors. I spoke to my second advisor four times in four years. Uh, they were really good meetings, but it meant that I only had to march to the drum of one advisor. Often you have two advisors, and all I can say to anyone doing a PhD is make sure you meet with those advisors together because not every advisor is on the same page. And so you don't want to try and meet with one advisor and come away with a list of things to do and meet with another advisor and come away with a list of things to do. You don't want to do that because if you do, you end up with you know, conflicting ideas. You want them together. So that if they have conflicting ideas, they can hash it out before you get all confused. The worst thing that happens is you try and do everything I tell you to do, and then you try and do everything the other advisor tells you to do, because you're just going to tie yourself up in knots. So we would have long conversations at this study buddies meeting. Mm, and so what's, once a week? Once a week, For every one week. one whole day? No. One hour. One hour. Oh. One coffee. And if we were, we could do it in half an hour if we really needed to, and we would do the... You know, we used to, what was it? It was, um, you know, the achievements, the blockages and the rocks, the goals for next week. What are your rocks for next week? So what are the things you absolutely have to do next week? And they become your accountability for the next week. And it's not, you know, write my thesis. It's, you know, I will write a page. I will write 1,200 words. Something measurable that you could say, yes, I did that. Okay. And then we would go into kind of support if people needed to go they could go but we would kind of delve deep into speedy's problem or into rebecca's problem or uh where can i get this i, I really can't get interview interviewees how can i get them any ideas and we'd have a long conversation about that so usually half an hour to an hour half an hour if we were rushed an hour if necessary sometimes people would have conflicting commitments i remember upamali 
wow, um, she got a university medal for hers. She sent off her thesis and it came back with no corrections and it wasn't a finance thesis. Wow. <laughs> finance usually comes back with no corrections because like if there's corrections, that means the math is bad and they do a lot of publications work. So there's really no point because the examiner is looking at something that's already been published. It's not like they're going to go back to the journal and say, oh, can you pull that paper and fix up this typo on page 12? Or I think you need to add, you know, a, a, a Wilcox measure on page 18. It's just yeah. not going to happen. So finance often comes back with no changes, but she came back with no changes on her thesis. And she went from submitting to graduation in like six weeks. Uh, and for reference, I submitted in the January and graduated well, I graduated in the June, <laughs> so it can take a while to do all that. Uh, get a group of people who you can work with, uh, and you need to be collegiate. Why? There are people, and we literally, we literally were having this conversation yesterday as advisors after my students' FTR. You need people around you who are going through the same thing as you, who can give you advice, give you support, act as a sounding board. They may not be in your discipline, but they know research and they can help you with the problem that you're having. So you can whiteboard it out. I'm looking at the whiteboard and you know that's literally what's on the page. What's on the whiteboard at the moment is my student's structure of his um, contributions and that's actually his contributions. So how he writes chapter 10. On the right-hand side is the answer to an exam question which has already been run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can whiteboard and discuss and bounce ideas off people. So have that support network. Have a rhythm to your work. Uh, I'm a... It's interesting. I'm a night owl, but having oh. kids it doesn't work. <laughs> so I would actually get up early and write early. And I like to be here, you know, at 7.30 at the latest because then I can start my day up, plan my day and work through. Uh, and if I get a good start in the morning, then I can actually get through. And the advice normally is block out time in your diary um, and kind of try and push all your stuff to the afternoons because that gives you the morning where you've, before everything turns to jelly, you don't want to, um, you want to have something done before you start doing the other stuff in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah, true. Otherwise, you'll start it in the morning and it will just carry on all day. You won't get anything that you want done, done. Um, don't get overwhelmed if you're doing a PhD because of the literature review, um, imposter syndrome. You know about imposter syndrome? 100%. 100%. Right? I'm not good enough for this, right? I don't deserve to be here, X, Y, Z. Exactly. Um, and, you know, you manage, what you, if you are an imposter, what you are really good at is fooling people into the fact that you are terrific. Because yeah, yeah. A, they're not going to waste their time on you if you aren't terrific. But advisors, I was literally talking with a colleague earlier this morning. He has three PhD students. I have one. Yeah. I'm looking for another one for next year when my current one graduates. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> but they need to be the right person because they will be with me for three years. And I think I could probably, three would be pushing me to maintain the relationship. I, two would be okay, um, but I'd be really pushing it to do three. And so if you're doing three and it takes you four years to do a PhD, so three, so let's say you've got three at a time, that means you, probably every two years you've got three, so one and a half, you've got a four. 20 year career, I can probably do 30 students if I really sat down today. Well, I've probably only got 15 years. So I've probably got one and a half students a year, 15, so call it 20 students in my career. I get yeah. five emails at random from people congratulating me on my work in marketing every month. <laughs> right? So they haven't done their research, they haven't done their homework, they don't know who I am. Um, they've just sent out emails thinking that that's going to work for them. And it hasn't because basically I've taken on or accepted one student in that way in the past five years. Yeah. <laughs> so I can maximum of 20 students. Um, I've probably more like really only 10 or five even between me and retirement. Mm. Um, 
So I don't, I'm not going to waste my time on someone who is not terrific. Uh, and if you are terrific at thinking, making people think you're terrific, that's pretty terrific. <laughs> uh, imposter syndrome. Uh, if you take a look at the work of a lot of people, uh, often you will find that their work is uh, not as good as they portray it to be. <laughs> uh, I had a partner um, at my old accounting firm. She would write the executive summary. And the executive summary would have stuff in it that was not in the, in the report. Uh, it's a summary. It's only meant to summarize. There should not be new ideas in executive summaries. But she told everybody about how great it was. Mm. <laughs> I have, I remember a colleague of mine, to be fair, it was a draft paper. He couldn't work out why he was having troubles with the paper, but we reviewed it. And remember I said about the research question is your building block. He had a research aim. The aim of this research is to do this, 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 and the other thing. So A, there were too many of those things. Second of all, four pages later, the research aim was something completely different. <laughs> he, uh, you know, and you've got so many deck chairs on the Titanic and you're trying to move them all around. And so the paper lacks clarity. So, you know, he's an esteemed scholar. Uh, it was early draft. He's gotten better, I hope. Um, and he um, had a paper that really didn't know what it wanted to be when it grew up. Everybody from <laughs> imposter syndrome, you know, um, there are always mistakes to be made. Don't be scared of making them because that's going to be the thing that holds you back. Not making the mistake. It's, it's not making the mistake that's going to hold you back. Making the mistake, you're going to learn from it and get better. And often, one person's mistake is another person's. This is how you should do things. Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just kind of curious about... Um because like I have some friends, they're writing thesis just like honours year and there is like this almost hush hush about their thesis where, you know, if they're like, especially in the same like faculty, they won't, they're not really supposed to like discuss the thesis with one another. They're sort of, really? um, yeah. And then especially like, you know, if, what's like, the rationale for that? Um, I think there's like this sense of competition um, and there's also like, you know, like, you know, um, my professor, you know, uses X database. They're not supposed to like, don't tell anyone about this. So I was sort of like, I was like, wow, that's lovely in the ideal world. Like, was it, um, was there like a big distinction between people in their, on, uh, in their like honours year and then PhD or is that like mm. the academic culture or what's it? There's always a subculture of people that don't want to talk with other people. Usually they're in finance. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and consequently, um, see, finance is math, yeah. right? And you look for proxies. That's usually it. You're coming up with formulas. You're coming up with proxies. And you're going to those databases and using various things. I don't know that I would say that was a cultural thing. Um, finance, yeah, I guess. Why? Not sure. I think because one thing there with finance, for example, is if you're using secondary data, so publicly available, already gathered data, if someone else thinks you've got a great idea, they can steal it, yeah. run the same data, because there's nothing special about the data, um, and get the same result and publish before you. So there is that, yeah. right? I think that's a main concern here. If you want to do long-term research and if you want to do qualitative research, the finance research is, is I probably feel it's not in the humanities because where's the people in this data, okay? Where are the people? Um, in the social sciences, in the humanities, my research involves speaking to people or reading literature and building from that a model that I can then use to go to speak to people or I'm giving people surveys, or they're in experiments. It's time consuming. That PhD, um, this one, two years to gather the data, to gather the data, right? Interviews, there's 55 hour long interviews. So that's immediately two weeks of work just to do the interview. For every hour you do an interview, there's four hours of transcription. Then, and then you're just starting. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, what, six weeks? Four, but no, it's, it's like three months, just gathering the data. Um, then you have to code it, and you have to code it conceptually, code it, um, what is it? Oh, sorry, code it thematically. 
So you divide it up into themes, divide it up conceptually. So what concepts are talked about, they're in your research model. And then you have to look for axials. You've got to go through that stuff three times, 500 pages of transcripts. If I tell you about my research model, <laughs> the only thing you're probably going to do is say, oh my God, I'm never doing that research. In finance, I can go to Oasis and pull the data out or Orbis and pull the data out and or join up and t test proxies. Much easier to steal your idea. Much easier to steal your idea. Um, but if you want a long-term career as an academic, you're going to work with co-authors. You're going to work with other people. And so you need to establish working relationships. And remember that cohort I talked about from a PhD perspective, about study buddies? Yeah. So Janice, Amber, Rebecca, Van Howe, uh, Saral, he's here. Sam, he's Saral here. Saral Gunnam? Yes, that's him. Oh! So I did, I did my uh, PhD with Saral. Yeah. Uh, he's quite the character. Yeah, he's uh, so fun. <laughs> until he gets your assignment and he goes, this is terrible and this is yeah. bad and this bit here, oh my God, I speak South African and this is, I can do better than that. What is this? You um, better send this to Saral. <laughs> uh, he's our token South African. Um, but, um, and who else was on it? Uh, uh, da, da. Anne Wallen, she's a staff member here. Um, Janice and Amber are both uh, postdocs at uh, QUT. Um, Van Howe is an academic at Deakin. I uh, forgot um, Maria. Maria is my second favourite Colombian. Um, oh. Colombian from <laughs> Colom from <sighs> second favourite from Colombia from Colombia. So it's <laughs> LO. Uh, she's at I want to say RMIT. Uh, Upa Mali is with um, Central Queensland Uni in the Sydney campus. She's in lockdown at the moment. Um, who else? Um, Speedy is going back to industry. So Sabrina Amir, she is Malaysian. She's, gone, she's got a job with Petron Petronas or Petronas. How would you pronounce <laughs> it in Malaysia? They own all of Malaysia's oil and energy natural resources. Um, and um, oh, Asta. <laughs> the first study buddy, or the third study buddy, she is a lecturer for USQ. We know each other. During lockdown last year, we organized a wine drinking session Aww. virtually. So everybody locked in and Asta and I, my study buddy, where is it? Uh, this one. Wow. So we edited this book together. So Asta Malhotra, or it's actually Asta. Ooh. Um, so we, um, so my study buddy and I, yeah. we basically did all the work. Ken <laughs> got the people together and killed us over the rough bits, the hard bits. Um, so Ken is a emeritus professor at UQ. So this is transformational leadership and not-for-profits and social enterprises. How did that come about? I used to consult a lot to, to not-for-profits and I used to, if you recall, way back earlier, work in not-for-profits. Yeah. So study buddy book, Van Howe is amazing. I believe she's got a big old award she's just received um, for teaching. Uh, and she's uh, published in A-Star. So we have a ranking system of journals that we talk about in the business school. We don't seem to talk about that elsewhere, <laughs> but we have effectively level D, do not touch a level D. <laughs> level C, eh. level B, getting better. Level A is very good. A star is the best, yeah. um, and then super A stars, which Professor Andrew Burton-Jones down the hall is the oh. chief editor of the super A star, MISQ, oh. so Management Information Systems Quarterly. Um, so just down the hall, one of the world's best researchers, like literally <laughs> the best researcher. He's kind of the researcher's researcher. He does yeah. 70 hours a week. And that's a light week. Um, Ooh, yeah. and, um, and there's not a... The worst thing you can do is when you're giving a presentation, the worst thing that can happen to you is he says, so look, I'm not very familiar with the literature in this area, mm. but I just wanted to clarify a couple of aspects of your research. And then he proceeds to tear it <laughs> apart and tell you all the things you didn't think about, um, which is um, soul-destroying, but you'd rather be destroyed then than when you submit it for um, Reviewer 1 and Reviewer 2. So he's quite useful for that. And he does it in a very nice way. And if you're doing early research, then you can get somewhere from him. So um, 
that study buddy group, that cohort. Big, so 10 people, did they all stay? Uh, well, because of PhDs, some people are leaving sooner than others, and particularly if they're on international visas. So Asta Indian mm -hmm. National, the day her she was driven, to, she got her um, degree and drove to the airport and left. No. Um, so she'd submitted for her degree. She, um, I don't think she ever graduated at the graduation ceremony. So she submitted. The examiners came back. The university awards your degree, uh, and she was able to pick up the testimony, the actual certificate, and drive to the airport with it, and then flew back to India. Wow. Um, so. People, what was left at the end, like when you graduated? Well, that's the thing. It's a rolling body of people. Um, oh. So there, was, there were new people coming on. I didn't mention people like Spring um, and a couple of others that were kind of... They could have slot in and slot out. There was kind of a core. <laughs> oh, um, that's so good. And then you sort of move along. Janice, Janice lives in Mackay, uh, so she wasn't always here. Uh, Upa Mali sometimes had teaching commitments on that Monday at 10 a.m., so I did a second study buddy in the afternoon just with her. And she taught me how to write in the Sri Lankan script, <laughs> which is very beautiful. I can't possibly do it. Um, so we would, we would time shift if we needed to, or if we, we might get people to, in those days, Skype in. Nowadays, we'd Zoom in, <laughs> but we'd Skype in. And what was really good about that is, hey, I know where all those people are now, and we're still in touch and in contact. Message Van Howe yesterday. I believe she's got a big old award. Uh, she was complaining about her R and R. That's is? kind of a that's kind of a badge of honour. <laughs> oh, I've got this R and R to do, which is revise and resubmit. Oh. So I've submitted to a journal, and she only submits to the top journals. I've submitted to a journal, and they've told me I need to do some changes and resubmit it, and they'll reconsider it. That's a win, right? Because <laughs> the worst is to get an R, which is reject. Yeah. <laughs> right. So oh. you want to revise and resubmit. You want an A, which is acceptance, but that's not likely to happen the first go. So anyway, she was complaining yesterday about her um, R, &R <laughs> that she has with um, uh, her reviewers who've asked her, oh, you really should cite these obscure papers from this even more obscure journal in your paper. <laughs> and she's like, oh, I'm pretty sure the reviewers just want extra cites of their paper, <laughs> uh, which is... Um, not necessarily how it should work, but some people do do that because, uh, like, it's a level C journal. So, why you'd be using a level C journal? It would need to be really specifically on topic for you to do that. And since she didn't cite it, it probably isn't. Mm. Um, so, having that network, I think, is important. Some disciplines don't like people, basically. <laughs> Finance, that's not always the case, obviously, as all stereotyping does um, and often some of your least gregarious people are in marketing mm. um, so that kind of bucks the stereotype yeah. but I think having people to talk to is important uh, I remember Maria so she's um, she's Colombian English is a second language she, uh, Spanish is a first uh, and she's not very good at public speaking so she did like three dry runs for me with her final thesis review of her final presentation. So she, um, you know, she was terrified. I don't quite know why in hindsight, <laughs> but she was terrified that her presentation was going to do badly. And you, we make you do three presentations uh, and that's to the wider area, but you actually give your report to your readers. So you've got two readers when you do a PhD and they read your work, send it back to you, a bit of feedback, uh, and they have a form. And it's basically one, two, three, and you want all ones. So if you've got threes, three is, this is not going any further. This is not great. <laughs> um, two is, unlike clarification, one is everything's great. So you want all ones if you can get them. Uh, so that's the thing that matters with these milestones. Your presentation, you could come in cartwheeling in a miniskirt <laughs> and you know stand on your head for an hour not a good idea in a miniskirt <laughs> but um, it, the presentation can go badly it doesn't really matter <laughs> yeah. but everybody focuses on the presentation whereas the decision is actually pretty much made by the time you walk in the room the readers give you your report two weeks before the presentation 
you would normally write up a response to readers document and you'd have your presentation you present and then people get to ask questions then they all leave the committees left and then they talk about what you have to do for the next step um, the juicy bits mm. reviewer one reviewer two so there's two reviewers two readers don't wait don't get reviewer one's report or reader one's report and go i mean if i'd read my first reader's report on my phd i would still be going she wanted me to get more data and i'm like it took me two years to get that data um we got on like a house on fire but that's what she wanted me to do and i'm like well, i don't think so mm. but fortunately reviewer two who was across the hallway here um said it's all great <laughs> <laughs> but you can that can be future research you don't need to do that to get the phd the phd is a start not the end of the journey um so and that's the other great advice that i received from that advisor that i saw four times mm. a good phd is a done PhD, <laughs> right? Love it. So the PhD that is not done is not good. Yeah. <laughs> you might think it's brilliant, but it's not. And I guess it's kind of like that imposter syndrome before. When I started my PhD, um, it was a finance person. <laughs> uh, bit of alpha male, right? Bit of, bit of <laughs> bit go the biffo, I'm good, I'm strong. <laughs> yeah. That's nice that you got that chapter written. I've got 50,000 words already done in my literature review, so I'll be done by Christmas. <laughs> and, um, yeah, he graduated with me. <laughs> um, partly, um, yeah, he just, he had, A, the PhD is only 80,000 words, right? I know you said, oh, my God, 150 pages before. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's 80,000 words is tops. He's got 50,000 in the lit review. So you've, you haven't even done your research yet. <laughs> How is this going to work? So you're going to have to chop, chop, choppity, chop. So he was actually starting from a worse place. But at the time, it was all, oh, I've got 50,000 words. I'm all good. I can do this thing. I'm fine. I'm, what are you even worried about? <laughs> yeah. Are you that terrible? Yeah. That was my first go at creating a study buddy group. Probably not yeah. the best study buddy to have. Um, but... Um, you know, slow and steady wins the race. I believe the outlining thing is important. Um, a good PhD is a done PhD. <laughs> uh, minimum viable product, getting it together where a stage where I could submit it. I may not submit it, but could I submit it? Which became the mantra of my last PhD, or my current PhD student, as he was coming up to write up, you know, I will have the chapter. It will not be the best chapter, but it will be a chapter, which is why. Chapter 10 is four pages long and it needs to go to like 10 or 15, but it's minimum viable product. It's a conclusion, does what it needs to do in the main. It concludes the thesis. It says what the contributions are. It says what the limitations are. It doesn't do either of those things greatly. It just says two sentences on a contribution. Mate, you just spent three years of your life, two sentences. We can, we can spin that out to a paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also it needs a an actual conclusion <laughs> there's it goes um, what is it it goes um contributions limitations and there's no final oh, future research and there's no final um, as you can see i've answered the research question it's all terrific there are some limitations uh, we've talked about the contributions excellent research boom off we go there's no conclusion rather like because you, you should have a the reader should know when it stopped. Yeah. Because <laughs> literally one of the readers is going like, oh, did I delete a page? What happened here? Um, so minimum viable product, a good PhD is a done PhD. Study buddy or cohort effect around you. And people roll on and people roll off. So when I graduated, Speedy sort of took on the mantle of yeah. um, coordinating the group. And that's when people like Spring and Sabelle and um, a few others sort of rolled on and rolled off. Um, we would often do like brown bag sessions where people would present their papers or they'd, um, you know, I'm having a real trouble with this reviewer. How do I go back to the reviewer? And the good thing, idea I missed earlier, reviewer one, reviewer two, you wait till you get all the reviewer comments in because if one reviewer says the opposite of the first reviewer, you can 
argue that you don't have to do it because the second reviewer didn't um, pick up on it as an issue. Yeah. I don't know about other juicy bits. Or lolly shops juicy. are good. You've got to go up to <laughs> lolly shops because you're going to have a... If you're going to have a productive afternoon after a productive morning, you go up to the lolly shop and fill up on sugar and then come back and... Unfortunately, PhDs, apparently sitting there and typing for four years is not conducive to healthy weight loss. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly if you go up to the lolly shop and buy a kilo of lollies and then wonder why your head's fried by the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, juicy, what was yeah. it? Yeah, so it's going to be about like anxiety and how to deal with the feeling that you don't have enough time. So, right. Yeah, that's like probably a concern for one of my friends. Okay. But okay. how do you sort of like manage your way? It's like, it's hard not to always see the end. Like, you know, a lot of people there feel like, oh, I'm going to rest when I've finished X and then... Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's a terrible idea. <laughs> a terrible idea. I know. But um, this is the goal setting literature. This is all about goal setting. And it's... Uh, it's eating the elephant one bite at a time. Yeah, but it's hard not to. <laughs> so it's hard not to, but you got to. <laughs> right? It's about the goal setting. It's about this page, this chapter, this paragraph. Right? It's, um, and it's also awarding yourself when you go off and think, Maria, <laughs> I graduated from my PhD. I got a pen. Um, <laughs> nice pen, but for my wife. <laughs> um, Maria submitted to FTR, passed her FTR, and went on a six-week holiday in Europe. Oh! <laughs> She's not done yet. Yeah. <laughs> she hasn't finished. She just passed her FTR. Um, when she actually graduated, she took three months off. <laughs> <laughs> There's a person who knows how to time manage. Because, uh, you know, she's still got the PhD, right? And she's less stressed. Um, I'm probably the worst person to answer this question because you do need some anxiety, some stress to motivate you to move forward. Yeah. But I remember <laughs> Rebecca and I sat down at one of the study buddy sessions. It was just the two of us, that one. And I planned out what I was going to write and I started off with the wrong base assumption. My base assumption was I had six months left of scholarship and I had one chapter written. <laughs> So I therefore need, I knew what my chapters needed to be, um, I had eight chapters to write. And that then set me, well then, if I work backwards, I need to do so many words a week. Well, that just was never going to happen. And I realised eventually that that was a drama. <laughs> oh, and how did you deal with it? When you Badly. Um, <laughs> so what I, I mean, I basically said, well, that's not going to happen. I've still got the piece of paper here somewhere, oh. probably in the filing cabinet. Um, oh, this is my... Um, Not on display, man. No, no, it doesn't get displayed. <laughs> it, um, coffee cups, keyboards, typewriters, <laughs> bags from Indonesia, they get displayed, but no, not <laughs> not pieces of paper that were big mistakes in my life. <laughs> but the um, piece of paper was basically planning out what I was going to do for the next four months, I think it was, because it was like August, and it was never going to happen. <laughs> uh, so um, you kind of have to accept that sometimes you things are not in your control but what you can do is goal set each week keep working see progress i think having the plan is good but you don't want to spend all your time planning and not doing because that's procrastination <laughs> okay you procrastinate for your country in the procrastination olympics watch me i won't even do anything um honestly i think um that's where mini breaks Support groups, like study buddies that are going through the same thing with you, they need to be on board with you. Um, and probably a life outside of PhD, because otherwise it will take up and absorb everything. So hobbies, I do my public speaking, uh, but hobbies, motorbiking, that was a good thing. Uh, Vlogging, YouTubing, we'll talk about that a bit later. <laughs> Vlogging, YouTubing, all of that. Um, how long is this thing going to be? My God, oh, how yeah, it's going to be, uh, yeah, well, it's already two hours, but I still have some questions to ask you. Are you in a time limit? Till 12. We've got a, a okay. bit longer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, um, the, whole, um, the whole scenario is um, you need to be in a good headspace. Um, be realistic on what your goals are yeah. 
and that starts with the research question and recognize that a PhD is not going to be the end of learning or the end of the question. Mm -hmm. So probably the big thing is, is your PhD too big? Because when I started, I was going to interview 70 people and survey 5,000 people. And at confirmation, they said, uh, if you interview 70 people and you do all this qualitative analysis and theory building you want, that's probably enough for a PhD. You don't. The survey can come later. Newsflash, seven years later, there's still no survey. Yeah. <laughs> um, so se having a reasonable scope for the work and realizing how long it's going to take. If English is your second language or if English is not your best thing, you're going to need someone to write, to pre-edit, proofread for you. Uh, if English is your second language, it may take you a long time to write, right? Uh, so that can be a problem. Um, so all of these things come into play. Yeah. Set reasonable goals. <laughs> set time away from the keyboard. Um, <coughs> newsflash, if you're into hour number 14 of working, <laughs> you are not producing your best work. Uh, deadlines are good. That's why the study buddy group would always say, hey, what are you going to do over the next week? And we had one person in our group and she would always set the same goals every week. Nothing got advanced. And she would talk about how she was a perfectionist. And I'm like, you know, perfect is as perfect does. A good PhD is a done PhD. <laughs> Perfection, uh, and she was doing a course, and, you know, she was currently, you know, six weeks late with submitting. She had a four-week extension. It was now two weeks past the extension. And I said, well, if you were my student, and she was up to 8,000 words on this 2,000-word assignment, I said, if you were my student, this is, marking your work would be amazingly easy. Zero. You're eight weeks late. <laughs> You're past the extension. What's going on here? You're going to get zero. You're going to fail the course. Why are we even having this conversation? Submit it. Submit it now. You'd at least get some marks and you'd pass and you'd be done. Instead, here you are torturing yourself later for no reason. Perfectionism is, I find, often an excuse for procrastination. Um, and so you need to work on that. But that person had a few other dramas as well going on. Yeah, cool. Last question on PhD before we um, move on to the next topic really quickly. Sure. <laughs> okay, so what was the ending of that, um, that paper that cannot be seen? So you had to write eight chapters, didn't happen. And what was the, I guess, So that was in like? about August 2012. It ended up being done in about September 2013. And for context, I taught, I've taught far too much during my PhD. Oh, so yeah. newsflash, you will be doing a PhD. People will come to you and say, oh my gosh, XYZ needs to go on long service leave or they've got sabbatical or they're having a baby or whatever it might happen to be. Could you teach the course? It would look good on your CV. That's what they will say. The proper answer to that question is no. Mm. Do not do it. I was told to do that, to say no. I said yes. I took like eight or nine courses during my PhD. I taught two, one, two, three courses at QUT, one, two, three, four courses at UQ in project management. I taught um, electronic commerce and then I taught two MBA courses. So I did 10 courses where I taught as a course coordinator or major lecturer during the four years. For record, three is a four years teaching load. Mm. So that's four years I did, I basically did the work of a full-time academic. Oh my gosh. So don't do that. I needed the money, is my defense. <laughs> yeah, but you had the scholarship. Yeah, but it ran out, remember? <laughs> <laughs> so in between that 2012 and that September 2013, I, had, I taught two MBA courses, which went for six months and they put me seven months behind. So oh, okay. I remember something like I had four chapters in with my advisor. Remember I started off with one or yeah. two? I had one full and half a one, or one that was written but needed work again, the theoretical literature review. Um, so I had up to chapter four, which is your research design chapter. So intro, background, 
theoretical framework and research questions or hypotheses and then how I'm going to test those hypotheses. That's your research design. That was I sent that to my advisor in the January and I don't think I sent another chapter until July. Mm. Uh, and then he suddenly got <laughs> chapter five, discussion of findings, chapter six, <laughs> which is... Um, boom, boom, boom. Well, chapter five is findings, six is results, seven is your conclusions. So you go boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and September they were in for the readers who then told me to chop out that page. <laughs> and then... I got a clean bill of health at FTR, apart from chopping out the page. And because it was October and the chairperson didn't get back to me till November, and I I don't think I had a course to teach, but something, I think it was end of school with kids. So we took um, a bit of a mini break because I figured if I send it to grad school in the November, no one's going to look at it till after Christmas anyway. So I might as well take the time and I submitted it on like the 4th of January. So then it got into everybody's inboxes and I had the results back by the March and it took two months for the university processes to kick in by the May. Yeah, okay. so that's pretty cool. That's yeah. what the story of the eight. <laughs> but, but I suppose at least the benefit of that was I realised that, hey, this thing is going to take longer than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I was wondering, damn, would those people that gave you the scholarship be pretty mad? Like, man, he's earning cash, but he's not doing what we paid him to for, do. <laughs> for the record, the cash was like working at McDonald's. Yeah, I know. It's like barely anything. <laughs> In fact, literally on an hourly basis, I would be better off working at McDonald's. <laughs> Uh, it was tax-free. That did help, uh -huh, yeah. uh, which was why it was good if I did the consulting because then that could be tax-free, but I'm an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> Still at heart. Um, yeah. 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 So that's where that went. Yeah, cool. Then we'll quickly wrap up on the final topic, and it's about being yourself. So, um, yeah, just wondering, like, you know, I think, yeah, definitely, like, one of the... Oh, oh shoot! The water! <laughs> that is literally what I was looking for. Fortunately, the water, fortunately, the carpet here is designed to be waterproof. So let's just... Yeah. <laughs> A little bit of an emergency. <laughs> Wow, that's very majestic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. as I was saying, um, yeah, keyboards. 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 Oh, wait, I was mainly... And personal talking, things. Yeah, I was thinking more about asking you about how you learn to embrace who you are. Because, right, like when people have nerdy interests, they're, they're like all shy about it. But has that been something that like you well, were comfortable with? Well, I did put the D&D &D books young? away when um, I had, <laughs> um, when I started Zooming from home for my lectures. So they went into the hidden basket. I'm not quite sure where they are now. They're not where my Zoom camera is. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think students like it if you might have a passion or an interest in something that is not theirs and they may not get it, but that's okay. They can work with that. Um, if you present it as something, you don't go overboard, um, but um, some people will connect with you. Some people will connect with you because you've got, they've, you've got a shared interest, so my 30-year-old keyboard. Um, some students know what that is and they're all, oh, wow, okay, cool. Some may not know anything about keyboards, but they can recognise that, hey, this person has an interest and it's something that they're interested in and that's a good thing. And whenever you're talking about something that you're interested in, you are going to share a passion. Uh, and so you're going to be more animated, more enthusiastic, and I think it's okay to have some personality coming through. Um, literally, as a program leader, I have a student committee. And one of the things that the students have complained about is lecturers just reading through the slides. Um, you know, what is it? Uh, inclusivity is a product of gender diversity and ensuring that your organization addresses problems as they arise. Wheeler and Francis, 2010. Okay, so... Lectures aren't meant to be read. Well, actually, technically, the word lecture means to read because back in the olden days, there was one book and the lecturer would read the book. That's what the term comes from because no one else could. There wasn't a textbook like in the 13th century. You would just write down your notes or listen very closely and the lecturer would read. But you can read now and the books are available. So you, the lecturer needs to bring something to the table that is more than just reading. So all of um, the interest, the passion, something you're interested in, 
textbooks that I can grab off the shelf and say, hey, I'm an editor on that book, and then I've got a book chapter in it, or um, the four, five books on information systems audit, <laughs> we can communicate and talk about that, or I can just grab it off the shelf. At least it looks reasonably impressive. This is my Zoom backdrop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about environmental issues. We can talk about keyboards. I can talk about my African students, which is up the top here. Yeah. So I've got these because the desk goes up. And so students can see that and they can't see the rubbish in my inbox <laughs> down the bottom. So I can talk about, you know, my African students. I think this is, I want to say Zimbabwe, but I'm probably wrong. It's a form of art. Uh, in one of the countries in Africa because I did work for UQ International working with um, people on public-private partnerships. So, you know, you've got things to talk about. You can show things about yourself and it's an icebreaker when you're talking with 500 students. You can talk to them about things that may or may not be of interest to them. But if you're passionate about it, they're communicating. I suppose as a lecturer, I find, hey, I'm giving you my best enthusiasm down the camera mm. or in the classroom when that happens um, and the student is sitting there saying things like well they're, they're looking at you with a very and they're like it's great that he's trying to communicate with me it is great that he wants to be enthusiastic I really appreciate that I'm not going to connect I'm not going to respond I'll leave my webcam off <laughs> um, but I appreciate that they're trying to do that what I would like is for people to actually communicate. <laughs> uh, yeah, true. But has it always been easy to sort of embrace your, you know, various interests as a child? Because that's like, I think um, when you're younger, you, you have to be the same, right? Otherwise, you're like the outlier. But when you're older, you have to be different. So it's kind of a different playing field. Uh, that's an interesting thing. Um, I, I think probably people still get penalised for being different yeah. as an adult. Just like, what, what was your blog post, right? Don't be too crazy. Don't be too normal. Just be a little bit crazy. A little bit crazy. A little bit crazy is good. Uh, and that can be your passion that you're interested in. Um, I think um, particularly when you're in a new job, you probably try to bury those differences a bit. Uh, after some time, you stop caring yeah. <laughs> and you just sort of do it. Um, although if I did get my typewriters out, one of the three I have in the room, and started using that to compile emails, I have a feeling I'll get a knock on the door <laughs> from my discipline leader who was next door saying, asking me to, you know, to stop do <laughs> making all that noise. Um, and I couldn't have that keyboard because it's loud. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's loud. Um, I couldn't have that if I was sharing an office. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, um, I think in terms of, uh, some people don't want to open up a bit too, a bit like that, but um, obviously there are boundaries, and I think some people um, prefer to have those boundaries kept separate. Um, I think that's okay, but at the end of the day, I think it's worthwhile, um, you know, putting yourself out there, building a relationship with students. Not everyone will like it. I got hammered for bringing out a typewriter in my last MBA class. My point wasn't trying to be that we should all have typewriters. My point was that technology moves on and what you think is a useful skill now will not be a useful skill in 20 years time. Uh, so all of those Excel skills, your ability to use Tableau or Power BI, uh, are they gonna be relevant skills in 20 years time? I'm telling you, probably not. So what you need to do is lifelong learning. Yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, but I thought that was like, wow, that's a beautiful place to end it. Lifelong learning, guys. Michael, <laughs> how do you pronounce your last name? Axelson. Uh, well, I pronounce it Axelson. I understand from Norwegian <laughs> colleagues that it should be something like Axelson. Axelson. <laughs> but um, I could be entirely wrong. So it's just Axelson. Yeah, Axelson. Nice. Well, sorry for keeping you so long, but I really enjoyed our discussion. So uh, thank I you for being here. you did. Here. Of course I did. Otherwise, it wouldn't be going for like two hours and 12 minutes. <laughs> Not that you're keeping trotch. That's yeah. all good. <laughs> yeah. Want to say bye. Ciao. Bye. <laughs>